In the last video, we laid the groundwork for how telephones ring. We talked about early forms of signaling, which used magnetos to produce the alternating current to ring bells in subscribers' telephones. We also covered how the earliest telephone networks didn't have much of a need for other call progress tones because human operators told callers everything they needed to know about the state of the call. This started to change as the network became more mechanized. The ringing machine behind me is a fantastic example of early tone generating technology. It's technically known as a P-type ringing machine, and it generates what's known as city ring. Phone freaks called it this because it was almost exclusively heard in larger cities where these ringing and tone plants were used. These came in three sizes, and this one is the largest of them. All three worked in the same exact way and produced the same tones. The only difference was the power output. This one was used for the biggest offices and could easily serve tens of thousands of subscribers. The smaller ones, up to 10,000. If you're anything like me, when you first see this ringing machine, you're probably thinking something like, why the heck did they need something so complicated just to make sounds? It's easy to forget that before we had modern solid state electronics or even vacuum tubes, many of the best ways to do things involved spinning metal of one kind or another. We don't know exactly where this machine came from. If anyone wrote it down, I haven't found out about it. What I do know is that it's from the 19 teens and it's actually missing most of its auxiliary components like the control and distribution frames that it needs to operate. Also, I'm told that it was dropped when they brought it here, and they repaired it with Bondo and painted over it. Finally, its table is missing the heavy slate top that it used to have. These pipes are to carry the cabling off the machine and through the slate to go under the table and out. But instead, they're just screwed to the metal table and if you look underneath, it's totally solid. This machine does spin very nicely, so it could run, but I don't think it'll ever ring phones again, at least not without recasting the steel in the middle part here. But it does make a lovely static display. So let's talk about how this machine works, because it's really cool. First, we have a DC motor and an AC motor. These didn't run simultaneously. The smaller, less complicated AC motor powered the machine under normal circumstances, and the DC motor only kicked in if there was a loss of power on the AC side. The switch between AC and DC is handled automatically, with almost no reduction in speed. This is a function of the large control panels that would have accompanied this machine. This ringing power board contains the equipment needed to sense variations in speed and voltage and can be used to control which motor is running and the output volume of the ringing machines. This combined AC-DC operation isn't unique. The motors that drive the panel switch run on both AC and DC as well and can switch between them as needed. Because motor technology was not highly developed in the 1920s, you always had to start on the DC motor and then switch to AC once everything's spinning. The next part of this machine isn't really used for tone generation, but we should talk about it anyway, since it's an important part of the ringing machine's function. This commutator is an output for plus and minus 110 volts DC which is used for coin control. When a payphone collects or returns your coin, a positive or negative DC voltage is applied to the coin relay inside the phone. One polarity will cause the phone to return your coin, and the other will cause the coin to be collected. Talking about payphones is outside the scope of this video, but it's important to mention that the voltage to control them is sourced from this machine. Why here? Well, before silicon diodes became a commonplace, one of the easiest ways to make high current DC was with a motor generator. And since we already have this big thing spinning in the basement, we might as well get everything we can out of it. 
In the center of this machine is a magneto, just like the ones from the last video. However, this generator can crank out a lot more power than the little magnetos we covered last time. One reason is that this doesn't use permanent magnets. Instead, it uses an electromagnet, which is supplied with juice from the coin generator that we just talked about. That same DC is used to excite these field coils, which energize these hunks of cast steel, creating a strong magnetic field that this coil of wire spins inside of. The spinning coil creates six to eight amps of 20 hertz ringing current at 80-ish volts AC. The ringing power is taken from these collector rings on the right side of the generator. From here, it goes through control and distribution circuitry before it reaches the switch and is sent out to subscribers. To the right side of the ringing generator is the tone alternator. This creates many of the tones you hear on your telephone, like dial tone, ring back, and busy tone. And through the magic of having six of them, I can show you the inside. This is the central portion of one of our other ringing machines. It's a bit smaller than the one over there, but it's from the same time period and it works exactly the same way. You can see the main ringing generator in the middle and the tone alternator on the side here. Inside the tone alternator, there are three rotors. For now, we're only gonna talk about the one in the front, but just remember that there's two more behind it and they work in a similar way. Around the outer edge of the alternator is a permanent magnet. Now, we're gonna use this magnet to magnetize the rotor in the center. The rotor spins at 1200 RPM along with the rest of the machine. And as it does, the teeth of the rotor pass over these pickup coils. When the high part of the tooth comes towards the pickup coil, there's a lot of magnetic flux present at the pickup and a current is induced. And when the tooth goes away from the coil, an opposite magnetic flux is present at the pickup coil, so a reverse current is induced. Because the rotor spins quickly, this process repeats itself hundreds of times per second, creating audio frequency tones. Don't worry if this all seems a bit complicated. This is actually the exact same way that many electric musical instruments work too. One example is an electric guitar. Here, the spinning rotor's teeth are replaced by the vibrating strings and the pickup coils in the tone alternator work the same as the pickups in the body of the guitar. It may be a different shape, but it's the same idea. And while we're making comparisons, it's even more similar to a Hammond organ, which uses tone wheels to create its awesome sound. It's super cool that there's so many parallels between how all these things work. The big difference is that when this ringing machine was invented, they didn't have vacuum tube amplifiers or really any easy way to amplify the tones for a transmission over telephone lines. So the output power of this tone generator had to be quite high. But here's where our story takes an interesting twist. So far, I've been a little vague about exactly what sounds come from where on this tone alternator. Let's dig into that a little deeper. This tone alternator uses three tone wheels to produce three basic tones. High tone at 500 hertz, which was used for internal telco functions. Low tone at 660, modulated by 120, was used for dial tone, busy tone, and reorder tone. Finally, ring back or audible ringing was at 420 hertz, modulated by 40 hertz. The modulations are introduced on purpose to roughen up the sound and make it more pleasing than a pure sine wave. So what do I mean by modulate? Well, if you look closely, you can see that each pickup coil either has many turns of wire or only a few turns. As the teeth of the tone wheel pass by these different coils, 
there's either a high amplitude wave or a low amplitude wave, depending on which pickup they're passing by. For example, if we take a sample of ringback tone and zoom way in, we can see the wiggles created by the teeth. And then if we zoom out, we can see that the overall amplitude of those wiggles goes up and down. That's the teeth passing over each pickup coil with a different number of turns of wire on it. Many turns, few turns, many turns, few turns. And the result sounds like this. Now, I had questions about this. For one thing, why did they choose to do it this way? What's really going on here is that this tone alternator wasn't the original sound of this machine at all. The tones from the alternator were chosen mainly because they were reasonably close to the sounds that telephone users were already familiar with. Let's take a closer look at this ringing generator and we'll see our first clue that hints at the real history of these machines. There are three brass rings here at the right side of the generator. The two outer ones are solid and the power to ring the bells is taken off here and fed into the rest of the ringing circuitry before it reaches the telephone switch. The center collector ring is different. It has six segments, then a solid part, then six more segments, and then another solid part. Notice anything strange about the center ring? It has no brushes on it to pick up the output. There's one for the right ring up here, and one for the left ring down there, but none in the middle. The wire that used to go there is cut off too. What's going on with that? Well, it turns out that the ringback tone used to come from here. Before the 1930s, the ringback tone, known as audible ringing, was generated from the same current that rang the bells. This center collector ring was used to modify the harsh 20 hertz AC and generate more pleasing harmonics. This modified sound was fed into the switch where it was capacitively coupled back towards the caller while the power ring was sent forwards to the called party. So the ring back that you heard was a filtered version of the actual current that rings the bells. And it sounded something like this. And the other tones were pulled off collector rings too. In this photo, we can see the same type of ringing machine, but instead of a tone alternator, it's got rings for dial tone and busy tone. Unlike ringback, these tones were generated by just interrupting the DC battery power. All of the tones generated by the old system sounded drier and raspier than what we normally associated with this kind of machine today. This way of doing things had problems though. In heavily loaded offices, the collector rings were burned by the constant sparking of the brushes and had to be regularly polished in order to keep the tones at a reasonable volume and quality. So the tone alternator was introduced in order to fix this problem. Most of these machines were modified to add the alternator in place of the busy and dial tone interrupters and the brush for the ringback interrupter was just removed altogether. The main takeaway here is that this machine sort of had two lives. First, it used collector rings and high speed interrupters to generate harsh raspy tones from the 20 Hertz ringing AC or from rapidly interrupted DC. Then sometime during or after the 1930s, the alternator was added and the tones became warmer and more pleasing and the constant wear and tear of the brushes sparking and eating away at the machine was eliminated. Huh.
You might notice that the tone we're hearing now is interrupted, but the actual current that comes from the machine is continuous. How do these interruptions get introduced into the line? These cans of tuna here are how we make those intervals. If you look closely at one of them, you'll see that there's actually three discs that are screwed together and completely sealed. For reasons that will soon become clear, I can't take one apart to show you the inside, so we'll just describe it and I'll show you some pictures. The discs are actually mostly hollow. Each one has a circular track or groove inside of it about a centimeter wide. The groove of each disc lines up with an adjacent groove in the one next to it, and they're kept physically separated by insulator discs, which are the thin dark lines you see on the side here. The discs are mounted to a low speed shaft, and as the ringing machine spins, the discs slowly rotate. Now, here's the cool part. Inside of each disc is a pool of mercury, which is kept at the bottom by gravity. Normally, the pool of mercury in one disc is kept separated from the adjacent pool in the next disc by the insulator between them. But each insulating disc contains strategically placed holes or ports. When one of those ports rotates below the mercury surface, it electrically connects the two discs together. The important thing about this contact is that it's almost arc free. Unlike a brush riding on a commutator, the mercury exists as a liquid in a partial vacuum filled with nitrogen, and it's not affected by erosion or oxidation like a solid contact would be. This makes it ideal for switching heavy loads repeatedly. Now eventually, the port in the insulating disc rotates out of the pool, and once again the adjacent discs are isolated from one another, and the signal is cut off. The timing and arrangement of the ports on the insulating disc determines the rhythms of the tones. Each time the port dips into the mercury, you hear a tone, and when the hole rises above the mercury, the tone is cut off. The tones are pulled off the discs by these carbon brushes that are arranged into these assemblies. Each set of discs provides a specific tone, depending on the needs of the central office. There's pretty much always certain ringing codes, a busy signal, and a fast busy, or reorder. In order to spread the ringing load, there are three different sets of interrupters, each offset by one third of a rotation. This way, there's always one on and two off for any given period, so the load is distributed evenly. I mentioned earlier that the ringing machine itself is only part of the story. These pallets contain some of the equipment that's needed to manage the machines and control the distribution of tones. Here in our storage, we've got quite a little zoo of ringing machines. And in a future video, we'll talk about this equipment, how we got it, and I'll show you the differences between the older P-type and the newer city ring machines that were manufactured not by Western Electric, but by General Electric. I want to take a minute to thank all the people who came before me and did most of the hard work and research that I used in this video. In particular, thanks to Evan Doorbell for the audio samples and to atlantatelephonehistory.org for documenting the many behaviors of these ringing machines. In the meantime, remember to like and subscribe, which pleases our robot masters. And see you next time.